In the bleak winter of 1944, amidst the dense woods and deep ravines of the Hurtgen Forest, combat medic Jacob Ruser, a young medic from Philadelphia, faced the most harrowing experience of his life. Since landing at Utah Beach on D-Day, he had witnessed the horrors of war, but none compared to the nightmares lurking in these woods. Soldiers on both sides clashed with such ferocity and in such a haze of confusion that casualties began to pile up like never before. For the first time in his life, Ruza witnessed something he thought impossible, the Americans and the Germans arranging momentary ceasefires just so that hundreds of soldiers could be dragged out of the battlefield before the fighting resumed. The forest was a sinister maze of destruction, a relentless meat grinder tearing apart earth and flesh. Here, Ruza battled not only the enemy, but the merciless elements themselves. As days blurred into frigid nights, the cold seeped into his bones, and the air grew heavy with the acrid stench of gunpowder and decay, punctuated by the haunting screams of the wounded. The forest crushed the hope of a swift end to the war under its dark canopy. Here, the German army, desperate for a last stand, became an unyielding force of nature. Amidst this chaos, Ruser embarked on treacherous journeys from the aid station to the front line. His resolve to save his comrades never wavered despite the bullets tearing through the air around him. As he carried the wounded, battling both the enemy and his own physical limits, Ruser knew US forces could not prevail through those conditions much longer. They had to put an end to that haunting battle. Later, as he remembered his nightmarish days inside the forest, he would say, quote, Hurtgen Forest, in my opinion, was the worst battle the US Army fought in World War II in the European theater of operations. It was hell on earth. Following the successful D-Day landings in Normandy on June 6, 1944, the Allies found themselves on a hopeful path toward a swift victory over Germany. The initial success of Operation Overlord was a major strategic triumph, significantly lifting the morale of the Allied forces. This foothold in Western Europe promised a rapid advance toward Germany and an expedient end to the war in Europe. However, the journey from the beaches of Normandy to the heart of Germany was fraught with unforeseen challenges. The Normandy region, characterized by its bocage or hedgerow terrain, presented a staunch natural defense system for the German troops. These dense, maze-like hedges and small fields transformed the landscape into a series of brutal, small-scale battles, draining both time and resources from the Allied advance. Moreover, the German forces, although reeling from the continuous onslaught, were far from defeated. Their experienced and well-trained units put up a tenacious defense, exploiting every advantage offered by the terrain and fortifications. The Allies also grappled with increasing logistical difficulties as they moved further from their initial landing points. The lack of major port facilities until the capture of Antwerp in September 1944 exacerbated these supply challenges. Key battles during this period, like the encirclement and eventual destruction of a large German force in the Falaise pocket in August 1944, demonstrated the Allied forces' determination and capability. Yet, they also highlighted the slow and costly nature of this advance. In September 1944, Operation Market Garden, an ambitious airborne operation in the Netherlands, aimed to create a pathway for a quick advance into Germany. Its failure underscored the difficulties of moving swiftly through enemy-held territory. The Third Reich, besieged on all sides by Allied forces, was floundering, yet Adolf Hitler clung to the hope that his engineers' secret weapons would turn the tide of war in Germany's favor. Caught between a rock and a hard place, German civilians faced a grim choice – surrender to the Soviets or the Americans, or stand their ground to the bitter end. Thousands perished under the relentless Allied bombardment, spearheaded by the American and British B-17 flying fortresses. In September 1944, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, reviewing his strategy for victory, sent a stark message to his officers. He stated, quote, The enemy has continued to reinforce his forces in the West. Present indications are that he intends to make the strongest possible stand on the West Wall in the hope of preventing the war spreading to German soil. The West Wall, known as the Siegfried Line, was a formidable German defense along the borders with France and Belgium. Eisenhower envisioned the final push for European liberation unfolding in three distinct phases. Battles west of the Rhine River, seizing bridgeheads across the Rhine, and a decisive advance into the heart of Germany. 
he deployed seven Allied armies across the Rhine, ranging from the north to the south. The United States 9th, 1st, 3rd and 7th armies, alongside the French 1st, Canadian 1st and British 2nd armies. The primary goal was to cripple the German war machine by targeting industrial hubs in the Ruhr and Saar regions. Once these were neutralized, Berlin was next in line. In early October 1944, the US 1st Infantry Division joined forces with the Yvonne Nieman 7 Corps, encircling the German garrison in Aachen. On October 22nd, after a valiant but doomed resistance, German commander Oberst Gerhard Wilk capitulated, paving the way for Allied progression. Allied command realized capturing the Ruhr Dam was crucial, especially if the Germans flooded the operational areas of the US forces. American commanders Collins, Bradley and Hodges concurred that the most direct path to the dam lay through the treacherous Hurtgen Forest. Historian Russell F. Wigley later reflected, quote, the most likely way to make the Hurtgen a menace to the American army was to send American troops attacking into its depths. And that was exactly what was set to happen. In August 1944, as the southern invasion of France drew to a close, the Allied supply lines teetered on the brink of collapse. This logistical nightmare resulted in acute shortages of essentials like food, ammunition and winter gear for the troops gearing up for the year's final battles. These supply chain woes handcuffed military operations, effectively tethering them to the sluggish pace of frontline resupplies. Compounding these challenges, American soldiers soon realized they were up against more than just the tenacious German defenders and their iron will. They were also battling the unforgiving wilderness of Germany itself. The Hürtgen Forest, a 20 mile by 10 mile expanse within a 50 square mile triangle bordered by Aachen, Duren and Monschau, became an arena of despair. Despite its relatively small size in the broader theater of war, it was a labyrinthine, daunting trap for those within its grasp. An anonymous US officer captured the essence of the forest with these words, quote, I never saw a wood so thick with trees as the Hurtgen. It turned out to be the worst place of any. On the ground, the forest's dense underbrush and towering conifers rendered armored vehicles and tanks nearly impotent, their usual blitzkrieg pace reduced to a crawl. The terrain leveled the playing field, significantly undermining the Allies' superiority in armor and manpower. In this twisted landscape, small units could effortlessly stave off larger forces. Large-scale battles were impossible in this environment. The only engagements the forest allowed were brutal close-range skirmishes and ambushes scattered throughout the seemingly endless woods. The Americans, overconfident, failed to adequately analyze the topography and climate of the forest. 7th Corps Commander Joe Collins later admitted this oversight with regret, quote, We had not studied that particular part of the zone. That was an intelligence failure, a real combat intelligence failure. The Germans had transformed the forest into a fortress to exacerbate the situation. Bunkers, pillboxes, machine gun nests, mines, tripwires and barbed wire littered the landscape. Every inch gained by the US forces was bought at an exorbitant price in blood. The initial clashes of the Battle of Hurtgen Forest, commenced in September 1944, spearheaded by Brigadier General Maurice Rose's 3rd Armoured Division. The 9th and 28th Infantry Divisions followed closely, along with a host of support units. The American forces made little headway against the entrenched German defences, deep within the shadowy damp forest despite their relentless efforts. Reinforcements were continually fed into the fray, transforming the Hurtgen into a veritable cauldron of conflict. Notable units embroiled in this punishing campaign included the 1st, 8th, 9th, 78th and 83rd Infantry Divisions, the 5th Armoured Division, the 505th and 517th Parachute Infantry Regiments and the renowned 2nd Ranger Battalion under Lieutenant Colonel James E. Rudder, a hero of Pointe du Hoc. From the outset, the German defences resembled an unyielding force against which Allied assaults crashed in vain. The forest's nature forced combat into a series of sudden, brutal skirmishes and ambushes, allowing no respite or escape. October intensified the conflict, with American forces encountering ever stiffer resistance. Every tree and hillock had been transformed into a fortress by the Germans, repelling advances with a lethal mix of machine guns, mines and artillery. Despite their persistence, American troops struggled to gain significant ground. The battle's focus shifted dramatically in early November, centering on capturing the Nazi commanders, Schmidt and Wossenach. 
The 28th and 4th Infantry Divisions of the US Army made multiple attempts to penetrate these areas, initially finding success but quickly faltering under savage German counterattacks. The seesaw battle for Schmidt became emblematic of the entire campaign, fleeting victories overshadowed by setbacks and losses. On November 20th, on his 27th birthday, Staff Sergeant Herschel F. Briels found himself in a dire predicament. On a slope near Scherpenseel, his destroyer platoon was hammered by enemy artillery. A direct hit set one vehicle ablaze, taking the life of one soldier and wounding two others. Briles, disregarding his own safety, dashed across perilous terrain to the burning destroyer, heroically rescuing the wounded and extinguishing the fire. The next morning, Bryles observed advancing enemy infantry. Manning his machine gun, he unleashed a torrent of fire, forcing 55 Germans to surrender, thereby enabling a critical junction between American units to stall for two days. Later, when another destroyer was hit by a concealed enemy tank, Bryles once again braved danger. He evacuated two wounded under heavy fire, and despite the risk of exploding ammunition, extinguished the flames in the burning vehicle. Another exceptional hero in the harrowing saga of the Hurtgen Forest was Staff Sergeant John Wilson Minnick. On November 21st, near Hurtgen, Germany, Staff Sergeant Minnick's unit found itself at a standstill, hemmed in by dense minefields, under a relentless barrage of German artillery and mortar fire. Realizing the predicament, Staff Sergeant Minnick volunteered to lead a small team through the perilous barbed wire and debris. Braving the treacherous terrain, they navigated over 300 yards through the minefield. When an enemy machine gun sprang to life, Staff Sergeant Minnick directed his men to cover while he alone outflanked the weapon. His courageous action led to the neutralization of two gun crew members and the capture of three others. Pushing forward, Staff Sergeant Minnick encountered an entire German company. In a display of extraordinary bravery, he single-handedly engaged the enemy, killing 20 and capturing another 20. His efforts enabled his platoon to subdue the remaining hostile forces. Continuing to spearhead his battalion's advance, Staff Sergeant Minnick again faced machine gun fire. Crawling toward the enemy position, he successfully knocked the weapon out of action. His relentless determination and bravery seemed almost mythical. Yet in the face of another minefield, fate took a tragic turn. Advancing alone amidst constant enemy fire, Staff Sergeant Minnick tragically detonated a mine and was instantly killed. His heroism epitomized the intense struggle in the Hurtgen Forest, a battleground marked by valor and tragedy in equal measure. Amidst these fierce clashes, combat medics like Jacob Ruza engaged in a desperate battle of their own, not just for survival but to rescue stranded, wounded soldiers. Ruza's duty was to swiftly treat and evacuate the injured to hospitals for full medical attention. He described the treacherous journey from the aid station to the front line, spanning 1,300 to 1,500 feet through steep ravines and enemy fire. Despite the challenges, Ruza never abandoned a fallen comrade, his frantic runs carrying wounded soldiers across his back while navigating the ominous forest under a hail of bullets severely taxed his physical and mental strength. His tireless efforts saved hundreds of Allied soldiers, but the haunting memories of those he couldn't save, faces of comrades lost in the shadowy depths of the Hurtgen Forest, would forever echo in his mind. Amidst the harrowing chaos of the Hurtgen Forest, Staff Sergeant Marcario Garcia, a Mexican immigrant whose family settled in Texas in 1923 to work as cotton farmers, found himself in the thick of battle. Already a decorated hero, Staff Sergeant Garcia had received the Purple Heart during the Normandy landings and later earned the Bronze Star. As an acting squad leader during the Battle of Hurtgen Forest, near Grosshau, Germany, Staff Sergeant Garcia's platoon was locked in combat with German forces. He realized that his company was immobilized by enemy machine gun fire, so he single-handedly took the initiative. Bravely, he advanced and neutralized two enemy positions, capturing four prisoners. Despite sustaining injuries, he fought alongside his unit until the objective was secured, only then attending to his wounds. In a later interview with the Houston Chronicle, Staff Sergeant Garcia recounted, quote, I did not know the wound was so serious. I was numb, I think, and besides, we were moving forward, and it was not the time to stop. Captain Tony Bizarro, the commander of Company B, recommended Staff Sergeant Garcia for the Medal of Honor, praising him as perhaps the finest soldier in the army. He reflected, quote, 
He was always willing to do anything he was asked to do. As December's icy clutches enveloped the Hurtgen forest, the battle devolved into a grueling deadlock. Soldiers found themselves contending not only with a steadfast enemy, but also with the harsh winter elements. The forest, in its rugged hostility, became an almost unconquerable foe, impeding both movement and military tactics. The onset of 1945 saw a cautious resurgence in American offensives, now tempered by the defensive demands of the German Ardennes Offensive, famously known as the Battle of the Bulge. This new challenge on the Western Front necessitated a strategic shift in the Hürtgen Forest. Finally, in February 1945, the prolonged struggle of the Hürtgen Forest reached its conclusion. The American forces, worn yet resilient, broke through, securing the Ruhr River and its critical dam. This hard-fought victory came at a steep price in human lives, forever marking the Hürtgen Forest Campaign as a grim testament to the merciless nature and unpredictability of forest warfare. In the aftermath, the cost of the Hürtgen Forest Campaign for the American forces, numbering approximately 120,000 men under Lieutenant General Courtney Hodges, was catastrophic. In stark contrast, the German forces, commanded by General Lieutenant Hans Schmidt, comprised only about 5,000 men, with an additional 2,000 in reserve. The composition of the German forces made their defensive efforts even more astounding. Over half were either underage boys or elderly men, far from the prime of combat readiness. Two companies of Duren policemen, humorously dubbed the Family Fathers by the German garrison, had their youngest members in their early 40s, underscoring the desperate human resources situation. Tactically, the Battle of Hürtgen Forest degenerated into a protracted, grueling war of attrition. The American forces continually marched into what effectively became a colossal meat grinder, gaining ground of dubious strategic value. The first phase of the offensive kicked off on September 14, 1944, with the capture of Schevenhutte. It was here that the 47th Infantry Regiment of the U.S. Army first encountered the unyielding German resistance, determined to hold their ground at all costs. The first phase drew to a close on November 7 with an informal ceasefire, brokered by a German regimental doctor, Hauptmann Günther Stuttgen, and the U.S. forces. However, this truce failed to secure the key positions in the Kool Valley. It wasn't until February 1945 that the U.S. forces finally took control of the Kool Trail. The second phase, dubbed Operation Queen, aimed to seize the northern section of the forest and advance towards the south of Duren. This operation was yet another chapter in the arduous and costly struggle that defined the Hürtgen Forest Campaign, a stark testament to the brutal reality of warfare and the immense sacrifices of those who served. Ernest Hemingway, then a correspondent for Collier's magazine and residing near the village of Wicht, grimly remarked on the Hürtgen Forest Campaign, saying, quote, Save everybody a lot of trouble if they just shot them as soon as they got out of the trucks. The Double Deuce Regiment, officially known as the 22nd Infantry Regiment and part of the Normandy landings in June 1944, pushed into the heart of Europe. Commanded by Colonel Charles Lanham, a friend of Hemingway, the regiment, celebrated for its motto, Deeds, Not Words, had been engaged in the Hürtgen Forest since the onset of Phase 1. However, by November 20th, 1944, it had sustained severe casualties, losing over half its forces. The toll was staggering, 3,000 casualties for an advance of just over 6,000 yards in 20 days. Lieutenant General J. Lawton Collins of the Seven Corps commented on the necessity of the engagement. Quote, We had to go into the forest to secure our right flank. Nobody was enthusiastic about fighting there, but what was the alternative? If we had turned loose of the Hürtgen and let the Germans roam there, they could have hit my flank. The casualty rate in the Hürtgen Forest was harrowing, with estimates suggesting one or two US infantrymen fell for every two yards gained. The double deuce alone lost a staggering 80% of its original strength of 3,250 men. Other divisions and regiments were similarly battered during the campaign. The German garrison, deeply entrenched, proved a formidable adversary. The ferocity in the Hürtgenwald was fueled partly by the apparent intentions of General Omar N. Bradley's U.S. 21st Army Group to seize the strategic city of Aachen. In the Hürtgenwald, dug in deep, were the forces of General Erich Brandenburger's German 7th Army, General Gustav von Zangen's 15th Army, and General Hasso von Manteuffel's 5th Panzer Army. 
Equipped with 1,000 cunningly concealed artillery pieces and ample ammunition, the Battle of Hurtgen Forest, as Army Colonel David H. Hackworth, a remarkable battalion commander in Vietnam, labelled it, was, quote, one of the most costly blunders of World War II. It was an avoidable campaign, marked by prolonged bitter attrition, where US infantrymen squared off against tenacious defenders, unforgiving terrain and atrocious weather. The Hurtgen campaign was predominantly a foot soldier's war, the dense, ravine-scarred woods, steep ridges, muddy conditions, and adverse weather, rain, fog, sleet and snow, nullified the usual American dominance in armor and air power. Tanks joined the fray belatedly, leaving the infantry to tip the scales of the battle. Ultimately, raw courage, rather than tactical prowess, saw them through the forest. The campaign devoured approximately 17 divisions, inflicted harrowing casualties, and severely tested troop morale. It stands as one of the most grievous setbacks for the US Army in the European theater. Technical Sergeant George Morgan of the 1st Battalion, 22nd Infantry Regiment, recounted, quote, The forest was a devil's playground. Fear was a constant companion. The missing dead haunted us, a grim reminder of what awaited. Artillery shredded the trees, turning the forest into an impenetrable maze. We trudged on, cold, wet, battling an enemy unseen. Despite its calamitous nature, the Battle of Hurtgen Forest remains largely overshadowed in the annals of history, eclipsed by Operation Market Garden and the pivotal Ardennes campaign. Its memory, predominantly absent from the memoirs of generals like Dwight D. Eisenhower and Omar N. Bradley, lingers as a neglected chapter in World War II's vast narrative. Ultimately, the offensive ended in failure. The Germans emerged victorious in defense, delivering a crushing blow to the Allies, who had hoped for a swift victory. The battles in the Hürtgen Forest and the subsequent Battle of the Bulge taught the Allies a harsh lesson about underestimating Germany and its fighting spirit. When the campaign finally concluded in 1945, US forces had suffered 33,000 casualties, with German losses almost matching this number. It wasn't until February 1945, nearly six months after the offensive began, that the US finally captured the Hürtgen Forest. Today, a memorial sculpture on the Cull Bridge commemorates the November 1944 ceasefire. Created by Michael Pullman, it symbolizes, quote, a controversial battle with no true strategic purpose that ended up making its way to the history books like the US Army's longest battle ever fought yet.